Ray Avery probably doesn't need much of an introduction. He's sent me a bio. I'm just going to pick the eyes out of it because this man, if I went through the whole bio, would be here till about 11 o'clock. <laughs> he has done so much in his life. He has been a street kid. Did you know that? Yeah. Way, way back. He is a entrepreneur. He's, he's internationally known. He is a speaker of fine quality and speaks all over the world. He's made major contributions to the development of New Zealand's pharmaceutical and medical device industry. Working throughout areas of Africa and Asia, has been exposed to the raw and real shortcomings in healthcare. In 2003, Ray, Sir Ray Avery founded the Medicine Mondiale an international network of scientists, technologists, and Nobel laureates who develop disruptive technologies that make quality healthcare accessible on a global scale. That's absolutely amazing, that, when you think about what he, what he has done in his time. He has been honored throughout the world, throughout New Zealand. And there's a couple of honors which I think are very important to, to, to have brought to our attention. Uh, this one, that's what makes this man this man that he is. He was given, and I need to find my place here, the Kiwi Bank New Zealand of the Year in 2010. That is an amazing honour. The Kiwi Bank New Zealand of the Year in 2010. The Blake Leadership Medal in 2010 as well. We all know about Sir Peter Blake. Again, a, a fantastic honour to be, to be bestowed. And in January of 2011, Sir Ray Avery was appointed a Knight Grand Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit, which is the highest order of New Zealand knighthood honours. <coughs> that, again, is absolutely <coughs> amazing. I can't say any more than that. Let's welcome Sir Ray Avery. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, I, I feel a little bit intimidated because, of course, you're probably getting your scorecards out right now. <laughs> uh, one thing that I can tell you about public speaking is that you need to be absolutely ferociously customer-centric, not just in public speaking, but everything you do in life, in your businesses and so on. And really understanding who your customer is is paramount to success. So you're my customers for the next 15 minutes. So I'm going to show of hands, who had murder bravery before this event? Just put your hands up. Talking 79.25%. Must try harder. It's very complicated when you're slightly biased. I was walking through the airport recently with Mr. McCaw and everybody said, Hello, Richie. <laughs> Half the people had no idea who I was. <laughs> um, but I think that I try every day to be customer-centric. And it, to everybody, whether it's the... Um, Mm -hmm. cab driver, and uh, I've taken to getting around in corporate cabs. Um, <coughs> not because I think I'm a knight and I'm special, but I've tried Uber, but it's really like, when you get a Uber cab, you're really paying for somebody to learn to drive, aren't you? <laughs> so, but at least in the back of the cab, I can actually text. And that's no mean feat for me, because I'm dyslexic, you know. I've no idea what I'm sending anyway. But um, in, the, in the back of the cab, I can at least text and carry on. And I got in the cab, and there was a nice Indian corporate cab driver. Now, I spend about a third of my life in India and Pakistan and the developing world. So I said namaste to the guy, and he just said, well, <laughs> at all. <laughs> and so, uh, but I think he looked at me as if he recognized me. You know, and I thought, well, he, he just wants to confirm who I am, you know. But I was on the phone, as usual. Uh, we had a problem in Nepal with one of the factories. And um, we kept moving on and on, and we finally got to near the airport Oaks, and then, Indian cab driver looks, he's looking in the mirror constantly at me, he just wants to know who I am. <laughs> and finally he cracked and he said, I'm terribly sorry, so I have to know. So I cleared the call and I said, well, I'm Sir Ray Avery. You probably would have read my best-selling autobiography, which is in its 17th reprint, I read for the courts. You wow. may have seen one of the TV documentaries on the work that I've done for Africa and Asia, restoring the sight to millions of people. In fact, by the time my youngest daughter, Anastasia, who's eight, is my age, a hundred million people have had their sight restored with stuff that I've mentioned. Oh, oh, you may have seen one of the TV documentaries on the work that we're doing with our nutritional products on a global scale. Or, of course, you would have read 
in the in the paper about uh, me being made uh, a, a knight grand companion, which is the highest knighthood you can get in New Zealand land. The same year I was going to be the most trustworthy person in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's not just fault. He said, actually, sir, I wanted, just wanted to know if you wanted to national or domestic. <laughs> 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 and that's when you get it horribly wrong. <laughs> you're not really focusing on the customer, you're thinking about what you think the customer wants. Um, one of the things I want to share with you, and it's for you guys tonight, and I don't normally include this in my, my talks, but I thought it was very relevant being very customer centric, because there's a whole lot of people in this room uh, from a whole lot of ethnic origins. But one thing we all share is that we came here um, as adventurers. One of the things that makes us different is that we left some other country to come here, all of us, whether we came on a whacker or a plane or a boat, and we came here in search of a better life, something that was better than what we left behind. Is that true? Yes. And, and we did do that, and, we, and we're amazing as a consequence of that, because we have a certain DNA that's given to no other country in the world, except for you guys don't know anything about it. You don't know who we are. You know, they say that you should never write about a country after arrival after two weeks because you stop seeing things. You know, you just know when you know where the dairy is, you go to the dairy. But when you first arrive, everything you see, everything. If I took you to my favourite tapas bar in Spain and said, "Okay, guys, now we're going to leave the restaurant. You've got to find your own way back to the hotel," you'd be looking and you'd be alert. But once you get used to things, you stop seeing things, and that's what's happened to us as New Zealanders. We think we kind of know who we are, but you really don't have any idea who you are. I do, because I'm a scientist, and my uh, life has always been about observation. Observation is the key to innovation. Everything that's ever been invented in the world comes down to one single moment of observation, somebody seeing something. And I was blessed because I was dyslexic at school, <coughs> short-sighted, and had poor hearing. So the only thing I had was a visual acuity to see what the way that the world works. And what I've come to is that New Zealand has we, we, we went around New Zealand about uh, eight years ago with Cameron Bennett, uh, the famous reporter, and we were trying to find out what makes us different. You know, as New Zealanders, why are we different? And we came up with three paradigms that make us different. The first one is we're not fond of rules. <laughs> you, you may think, well, there we are, we follow the rules, we do things, but we've got, we've got this discretionary stuff as New Zealanders, right? Because what happens is, we generally vote when we're supposed to, and we drive on the correct side of the road, do all that. But let's just try this social inequality experiment, right? We're all law abiding, right? There's no cameras in the room. Um, who in the room has got a deck or a window or an extension to a house or a batch that they own they haven't got a permit for? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's better than that. That'll be fucking fine. That'll be fine. <laughs> don't worry about it. We just don't give a shit. <laughs> we just don't give a shit about certain things. <laughs> That's all right. There was a guy called Peter Beck. Anybody heard of Peter Beck? Yeah. He yeah. went down to the Racky Golf, put a rocket up into the stratosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Did he have a permit? No! Because <laughs> he's a New Zealander. <laughs> <laughs> he did it three more times with our permits. He just went to Michael, Michael Bay and said, can I put it up in your office? Oh, yeah, of <laughs> Now, if you try to do that in America, uh, you'd be locked up. You know, the FBI would be around your place with tracker dogs. They'd lock you up. Even in Australia, they want to know where it's going to land. We have no idea what it was going to land. That wasn't the point. We just want to see how high we could get. <laughs> so that's the first characteristic that we have. The second one is we have no respect for the status quo. Because just because we don't know something doesn't mean we won't give it a go. And that's what happened to me. I remember coming to New Zealand and my background at that stage was in agricultural research, forensic science. Did I know anything about medicine? No. <laughs> but somebody came to me and said, would you like to set up the Department of Clinical Pharmacology and Walter Medical School? If I'd have been in the UK, I'd have said, I can't possibly do that. I know nothing about medicine. My knowledge of gross anatomy is, is, is appalling. <laughs> and I know that even less about pharmacology. But of course, I've been in New Zealand for about 18 months. So I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I, I, they made me go to medical uh, because my contract was going on for years. And they said, we've got this super duper x ray machine, and we're going to give it to you because we want to make sure you're not going to die during your contract. And you know what you do when you get those x ray results? You know, in the waiting room, you open it up and have a look at it. Yeah. Even I could see there was something probably wrong. I was only 32 years old, but there's this huge 
Kent's just great. Well, they flung my books. So. Mm. I went into the doctor and I slammed that down and I said, that's not good, is it, doc? She said, that's your heart, you'll need one. <laughs> <laughs> that's how bad I was. Didn't <laughs> set up the best clinical teaching there. But there's another guy I want to talk about in terms of not knowing what you're doing. There's a guy called Bill Buckley. Anybody heard of Bill Buckley? Mm -hmm. If you've got one of these uh, mobile phones and a flat screen TV, you've been touched by Bill Buckley. He makes about 85% of the electromagnets to fire up the chips to make any photon display work anywhere in the world. He's also invented a whole lot of technology <coughs> which will actually surpass you getting um, irradiation with terrible uh, photons from um, nuclear fuels. So basically, he can use the same technology to treat cancer in a much more controlled way. Is he a physicist? No. And has he had any training in physics? No. But he's got that characteristic of New Zealanders. Just because you don't know something doesn't mean you want to give it a go. So that's the second characteristic. And the last characteristic we have is that we get to dream. We shouldn't win the America's Cup. And we shouldn't win a lot of the competitions around the world. And most of you don't know that billions and billions and billions of people every day are touched by our cleverness. So for instance, I tell this story about a farmer who gets up in the morning and he decides he's going to make an omelette. So he uses an egg whisk. We invented that. Then he decides to make some spreadable butter and put it on his toast. We invented spreadable butter. Then he decides that he's going to move the electric wire fence because he wants the grazing to be increased. We invented that. Of course, then he decides that he's going to do the milking. We invented all of the milking equipment that people use globally around the world. And then, of course, he decides, being a true, true Kiwi, he decides it's lunchtime and I'll go up the river and do a bit of fishing with his son. So he takes the jet boat up the river. We invented that. <laughs> Gets to the other side of the river, decides to crack open a beer, opens his little beer. And of course, Morton Coots invented the world's first continuous brewing process, which is used by Heineken, Ashesi, Ash and every beer in the world comes down to Morton Coots, who developed the process for continuous brewing. Mm -hmm. New Zealand has invented that. Mm -hmm. And of course, he comes home and uh, he knows his dog's a bit crook, needs a little injection because he's got a sore paw. So he gives him a little injection of antibiotic with a plastic disposable hypodermic syringe. Now a guy called Colin Murdoch invented that and it changed global health care. Before that, we're all getting injected with glass syringes. In fact, when he was inventing that in 1953, I was in an orphanage in the UK with a whole school lined up in alphabetical order to have our vaccinations. And there was this huge nurse, well she looked huge at the time, she had this huge surgical stuff on she had a bucket of vaccine and one 50cc syringe with the same needle. Oh. So we didn't know about AIDS and cross-contamination. And she just went down the whole school in alphabetical order with the same needle. Wow. Bloody God, my name was Avery. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two daughters, Amita and Anastasia. <laughs> <laughs> but he changed the world. One man changed the world. And I knew Colin before he died, and he was one of the great inspirations. And I thought, if one person can change the world, then maybe I can. And that's what set me on this course, to use all the skills and knowledge that I can to change the world. And we do this every day. Um, but we couldn't do it without people like you, people who I have no respect for the status quo, um, who dare to dream and are not fond of rules. So you should all be very, very proud because we are New Zealanders, we change the world for millions and millions of people every day. Thank you very much. Oh, really?